Now the Prime Minister has announced he has got plans to build new gas power stations to be back up for well, unreliable wind and solar power uh, to cut the risk of energy blackouts due to those net zero pledges that, of course, he's fully signed up to. Joining me right now to discuss this is Head of Policy at Net Zero Watch, Harry Wilkinson, who joins us once again. Thank you for the, coming to the studio. Uh, and also, of course, uh, Charlie uh, is still here. Charlie Rowley is a former Conservative advisor. Um, I'm going to be sending Charlie on an education course uh, at Net Zero Watch uh, <laughs> to learn some facts about this. All MPs need to have on all sides of the uh, political divide. Um, Harry, I find it absolutely extraordinary that we have a Prime Minister of this country who is announcing we need to build some new gas power stations. Otherwise, we might have blackouts because we won't have enough energy because of our own policies. We're a first world country. We ain't a serious country anymore though, are we? That's right. People can debate this uh, decision if they like, but this was an inevitable uh, result of the fact that the lights would simply go out if we don't build this firm, reliable capacity. Now, why, why would they go out? Explain. Because when you think about renewables, we've been expanding wind and solar energy uh, to a great degree. We've been subsidising them by billions of pounds. Sodding wind turbines But unfortunately, they, they don't work all the time. When it's not windy, when it's not sunny, uh, they're simply not there. So we need to have that reliable backup capacity. I mean, we could do storage, but that's incredibly expensive. We could rely on an energy for our, from our neighbours. Uh, which we've done to a certain extent, but it's expensive. And again, we don't have that energy security when we're relying on other countries. So and actually, when they need their energy themselves and then say, oh, I don't think we will export it to you this week. Indeed, Norway have often threatened that they would turn off their own supplies in winter if they needed it more than we do. So, you know, this is a very important decision. It's the right decision, but it's come very late. Uh, and we, we have to remember, Britain has some of the most expensive electricity uh, prices in the world, particularly for businesses. Uh, and that's done an enormous amount of damage so far. So this is a good yeah, decision. That damage uh, But it's come very late. Well, this is the thing, because anyone who's been paying attention at all will know that we need to have the backup for the renewables. Yes, it's all very well. You can, when, the, when the wind is uh, blowing and the sun is shining, oh, lovely, let's, that's fine, let's use that. However, as you say, it doesn't all the time. So what do you do when it doesn't? And the obvious answer to that is to have those backups. I would have thought the even more obvious answer is just to only have the backups and not bother with the energy that's not reliable. That would seem to me to be the obvious thing to do, unless or until we do have the battery storage, the ability to store that, uh, uh, that energy in a way that is cost efficient and it can be distributed. So, yeah, you can store all the lovely sunshine from the summer, assuming we get that every year, fingers crossed on climate change, um, um, uh, and you've got that there for the winter. But we don't have that ability. It doesn't, it's not just it's too expensive or inefficient. It doesn't exist. We don't have the ability to store all the sun from the summer, so we've got it for mid-January. That doesn't, not, not, not even on the cards right now. So we need to have something to back up. Here's the thing. When the government signed into law, you know, net zero policies, and particularly the, um, the carbon zero, net zero um, policies for, for, for energy, particularly for electricity, 2030, for Labour, they say they're going to be carbon neutral, no, carbon emission neutral. Um, 2035 for the Conservatives. Um, they must have known at that time that we would need to have backups. And yet we're down to, in a few years' time, one nuclear power station going in, being left in action and, and we won't have enough gas capacity either. Well, we saw these extraordinary scenes of government ministers uh, celebrating as they blew up uh, coal power stations. How foolish does that look now? Yep. They knew at that point that our nuclear capacity was dwindling, that we weren't going to be able to replace it quickly enough, uh, and they went ahead with this approach anyway. 2035, 2030, both are completely unrealistic. Um, but I think there are signs, I mean, this is coming late, but there are signs that things might be starting to change. There's been this big uh, debate within government about the so-called boiler tax. Explain what this that is. This was the first. plan to fine boiler manufacturers if they didn't uh, provide enough heat pumps. And, and basically, at a certain percentage, so if you're a boiler manufacturer, you have to sell a certain percentage mm. of heat pumps, completely inefficient, twice as expensive, don't actually work very well in terms of, ha, small point of heating your home, which That's is what right. you, have a, you have a boiler for. Um, um, they, they were going to be fine, but thousands of pounds for each one that they, each regular boiler, the gas boiler, they sold over the percentage they were required, they were mm. allowed to sell. Now, £3,000 per heat pump missed, as it were. And that target was small in the first year, only 4%, but it would still add £120 to the cost of the average boiler. And yet, 
as that target increased, you know, to 600,000 heat pumps a year uh, by 2028, we would see an enormous rise, perhaps thousands of pounds added <laughs> to the extra boiler. Because, because that price would just be passed on. But also, people don't want heat pumps because they've, <laughs> crazy enough, they've looked into whether they work or not, and they don't work very well. If you've got a massive big old house, it's got wonderful, you've got a massive big garden, and you've got amazing ability to, uh, to do an awful lot of um, uh, refurbishments where you mm. can insulate, and absolutely fine. Norway, I understand, has huge numbers of these things, but their houses are built to withstand very, very, very low freezing temperatures. Um, and therefore, you know, it, it, that's, that's how it functions. Most British housing is not built like that. It is not possible to completely change all of British housing in the next few years to make that possible. I mean, genuinely, I'm not mm. joking. I, 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 I said it for, you're going to take my gas boiler thermostat out of my <laughs> cold, dead hands rather than, I mean, I literally, well, no, I, if they banned them, if they banned them, I would literally just buy two gas boilers and have them just sitting there waiting and pay someone to put them in. And I think that's what other people would do. Well, I mean, I do want to say I'm not against heat pumps. They will work well for some people. But they, but the important thing is here is that people shouldn't be forced yes. to use them. If they're them. good technology, we'd move to them anyway. Exactly. exactly. And so the government has actually confirmed twice now to the Telegraph They've that it them. wouldn't be going ahead with fines. However, there's been an internal debate with Lord Callanan and Graham Stewart threatening to resign uh, if the policy was scrapped. OK, so well, by then, this... resign, resign. We've um, had this the sort of well, The Energy Secretary, Claire Coutinho, who's been speaking uh, about this issue this morning, she's she's pretty sane on this type of thing. But they've already pushed back the uh, requirement uh, for um, no uh, hybrid or uh, fossil fuel cars, petrol diesel cars, to be sold in this country. It was at 2030, it's back to 2035. Labour want to stick to 2030. Again, they haven't even got the electricity charging points. They won't have the electricity to charge these cars and these other vehicles with. Um, it seems to me that each of these policies that were set in trade, it was years ago, years ahead, so don't worry about it. And as we approach each of these, these targets coming in, in the next few years, mm. they're all going to be dropped. What we really want is someone to look at the evidence and go, all of these targets should be dropped and we should allow the market to decide and when a great new technology emerges and when, it, when we've got the cars that work and the charge points and we've got the electricity, we've got everything, then we'll all switch anyway. We'll do it naturally. We don't all want to go around in a horse and cart anymore because mm. the technology we've got is better than that. Well, there are signs of hope. It's not enough, but there are signs of hope. I think the bigger picture here is look at the overall statistics. We've reduced our emissions over 50%. We still rely on fossil fuels for 75 percent of our energy. The, I mean, most the people don't know that. They don't know that. The extremists are demanding that we have all this extra pain for just a little, a few uh, emissions at the end, maybe from 60 to 80 percent to 100 uh, percent. Why should we go through all this pain just for nothing. that radicalism of going completely net zero when we can achieve a lot? But, but it, uh, will, without it will going look so good way. on uh, World Summit. So, oh, by the way, small point worth making. To achieve that, you'll have to have all these wind turbines everywhere and solar panels. Where are they mostly made? In China. China. And how does China uh, get the energy to do that? Coal. <laughs> Ta-da, everybody! Charlie Rowley, your face. Says a picture. <laughs> well, no, I'm, I think it's a fascinating discussion. And um, I think it's all about making sure, as you've said as well, the, the technology. And I think if you do have these ambitious targets, now they might be dropped, but they're ambitious targets to have nonetheless. I don't want to drop them. I'm committed to net zero by 2050 because I want to see better technology. I want to see energy bills come down. I want us to be able to have... Targets have, don't have, create have, the but, technology. But if you don't have the targets, then you don't have... Uh, uh, people stepping up to try and deal with the, it's the, the issues that we're talking about. It's not just a target. It's a legally binding commitment. So that means meeting the target means more to the government than preserving people's quality of living. That, than actually... The, uh, yeah, that's the cost that's of I wonder whether we're going to be allowed to build nuclear power stations or gas power stations under this target legally. Here's my thing. We are a first world country, and the fact that anyone is even discussing the possibility that it could be blackouts, I, I find utterly absurd. And any government that has got to that position has no business being in power. I'm sorry, but it's an absolute joke that we could even be discussing that. And then we've got an energy secretary saying, without gas backing up renewables, which they have currently, until today, not has a policy, we face a genuine prospect of blackouts. You should hang your heads in shame, uh, the MPs who voted for this. Harry Wilkinson, thank you very much indeed. Head of policy at Net Zero Watch. I'm sending you two out for lunch, so you're going to educate him on some facts. Charlie, we're going to come <laughs> back. You're going to come back a new man knowing facts about this and change your, your woke <laughs> tune on this. 